Um, it's very nice to be here. Um, I've been putting up this show with uh, two of the people who work here, um, Ed and uh, Wayne, and they were great helpers. And the show went up very smoothly and easily with no problems, which is always great. Um, As Dr. Zona said, um, I do have a scientific background. I, I went to college, I majored in physics and uh, engineering and finally got a degree in mathematics. And while I was in college, I started a business. I went to school in, at Wayne State University in Detroit. I'm from Detroit. And part of my background that I think is really touched me in some way is the, the, the mythology of Henry Ford. And uh, I still love Greenfield Village. I always like that place. Uh, it's, a, it's a village that Ford created with uh, workshops and homes of some of the most profound makers and inventors of the 20th century. Whenever I go back there, I always make sure that I surreptitiously rub my hand over the workbenches of the Wright brothers. They were heroes of mine. Um, when I was in college, I started a business. I was making copies of wood carvings and stone carvings. Um, I, was, I, I always made stuff. Uh, by the time I was five years old, I had a workshop. Uh, I had a job when I was five years old. Uh, I had a, a great uncle who had a, an atelier making uh, trunks and luggage and on Sundays I would go in and work for in the mornings and there would be a can full of bent nails and my job was to straighten the bent nails and I was good at it. Um, and this business that I had in college I ended up um, making a bunch of money or what seemed like a bunch of money then when I was living in public uh, student housing for $28 a month rent for a two-bedroom apartment. And uh, I, I, I moved to New York after I graduated. I was going to be teaching uh, math at a boys' vocational high school in Brooklyn. And I was there that summer, and I got an apartment where fate always seems to provide me with a workplace. And that we got an apartment, my wife and I, and my my pregnant wife and I and my daughter got an apartment on 17th Street and I said something to the, the not the, the super, I said, is there any possibility of any place around here where I could work? He said, well, there's an empty room in the basement. If you clean it out and you let me work too. And I said, sure. So I clean, and it turned out that room was right underneath my apartment. So if I was working down there and my wife wanted me, she just, <laughs> bang on the floor. And um, <clears throat> I started making these, they were like copies of strange faces in wood and I was making rubber molds and my ability to make things has oh, always been pretty good. So I would make these copies and I'd show the real one, I'd show the copy. People couldn't tell which was which. Um, in New York, um, my first big client was Bloomingdale's and they liked my work a lot and they ended up saying if we get you original antiques to copy to make molds off of would you do that only don't sell them to anybody else in New York outside of New York we don't care so that was fabulous so they had access to things that I didn't have access to and I ended up starting to do mirrors also and I, at one point, um, got a shop in Greenwich Village, and it was called Gargoyles. That was the name of my business. And I was doing a lot of things with mirrors. And at one, uh, it's one year I went to Europe looking for interesting things to, to buy in antique stores to copy. And I got some kind of mirror frame that had a curved mirror in it, a convex mirror. And I became really enamored with convex mirrors and then I decided I want to bend glass. I want to make my own mirrors. And um, it was that kind of led me towards doing my own work rather than just copied work. And uh, 
I ended up getting a, a besides this business, I got a studio down in Tribeca, which at that time I was one of two or three artists on this block. And um, I started bending glass. Um, I found somebody who had been bending glass for three generations and he told me, gave me some advice and I started bending glass and there was an old Italian uh, glazer who also did mirroring and so he would mirror the things that I would bend. And one of the things that happened in these electric kilns that I made, sometimes I'd forget that I had something in the oven and instead of having this kind of curved thing that would be a good reflective surface for mirroring, they would get drippy and drapey. And I put them aside, and at one point I said, wow, these are great. These, I could make some interesting form from flat glass. And I started doing that. Um, the first, one of the first shows that I had of that work was with uh, Ivan Karp at when it was OK, at it, not at OK Harris, but he had a gallery called 100 Acres, and which was across the street. It was a smaller gallery. And um, so glass has been a medium that I've used for a long time. And my most uh, successful period has been when I was doing this slump glass work. There's something called the glass movement. And there's a, a, mu a museum in Toledo that shows a lot of glass work and Harvey Littleton and that whole glass movement kind of started around there. Uh, and I have some, they have some of my work from that period. Um, and I've, um, I was so successful. People were flying in before openings to buy the work. And I thought, well, I've arrived. This is, and this is how it's going to be from now on. And that's ex not exactly how the art world works. Sometimes you have periods where everybody wants what you have, and then there's periods where people really don't like what you, they don't care about what you're doing. And I have always been, um, I'm a little, I'm a, a soft ADD, which is kind of interesting for an artist because you get bored with stuff pretty quickly, and so you're always looking for this new exciting adventure in creativity. <clears throat> and that's been the way that I've lived my life. Um, and so sometimes people just weren't interested in it, and then sometimes people, it was, you know, it somehow struck some cultural nerve. But the work wasn't made to sell, it was made because I was discovering something exciting. And that's really the way that I work. Um, <clears throat> at one point, um, <clears throat> at one point, uh, and when I noticed that the, my, the, the income thing, sometimes there would be like this, sometimes it would be like this, sometimes, and it, it's, it, it's, and I got to a certain age, I said, enough of that. I said, I need something that has a more regular cash flow. So I decided that I would, I had been making jewelry and giving it away to people. And I said, oh, I bet. And people were saying, why don't you sell it? And I said, no, 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 I'm just giving it away. I decided to make jewelry and see if I could make a business out of it. And uh, I ended up doing that. And I have a one part of my studio is devoted to the jewelry that I make. And the store downstairs has some of the jewelry. Um, and uh, I, I design it. I have invented it and worked with it. And I have some assistants who do most of the production work. And I do the more interesting, exciting, creative stuff. And it means that um, I don't have to worry in the same way that I used to about how am I going to pay the bills because I haven't sold a big expensive piece of work this month. Um, and my wife was very happy about all that. Um, about six years ago, I had been fooling around in the studio, and I stuck a couple of hat pins. They were big ones. I, like, I use a lot of hat pins for different stuff, especially if I'm, if I'm painting or drawing. I'll, I like them to stick the paintings on, into the wall to hold them up, to look at them. Um, and I ended up, they were parallel, horizontal, and I put a strip of mirror on there. And I'm not sure exactly why I looked at it, there was a light on it, and there was a reflection above and a shadow below, and it was this eureka moment. 
oh, that's cool. And I started working with pieces of mirror. Uh, and it was all of a sudden, there was like this new adventure in, in making stuff. And it was light and in shadow. And it was like something about it was so striking to me that I could work with, with light. It was very thrilling. And over, uh, for the last six years, um, off and on, I'm, I've been working on this. Sometimes this last year uh, was really devoted to painting. Uh, and the painting came out of the work that I was doing with mirrors uh, because I was these, the patterns on the mirror <coughs> are put on sometimes with, uh, you know, just what I'm using these days is I'm using glass that has silver and copper on it. Uh, in, in the industry of making, of the glass industry, when they make mirrors, they run sheets of glass down a production line and there's some chemicals go on it and it precipitates silver. Gets cleaned off by air, keeps going, precipitates chemicals and puts on copper to protect the silver. Cleans off by air, goes on, gets painted, goes through a baking oven, comes out like the mirror that you know with that gray paint on the back to protect it. Uh, so I have a factory that makes a glass for me without the, the paint. And it allows me then to acid etch off places where I don't want the silver. And uh, sometimes I use paint to protect it. Sometimes I'm uh, laminating the, my currently I'm laminating the glass together to protect the, uh, the metals. And uh, I've developed a lot of ways to make design on it and to protect the metal when I, to protect the, to protect the metal when I'm washing it away with acid. Um, and it, it, it's been an adventure in making. Uh, this is not the, I'm, I'm, I've always been interested in different areas of technology or simple making from the plumber to the electrician to in New York, wherever I, wherever I get a chance, or if I can go into somebody's workshop or factory, I love that. That's like a home to me. And uh, I'm always curious about techniques. Um, of, of, of making stuff. And so I started researching in the glass industry how better to do this kind of stuff. And um, what I have found all through my career is, as, a, as, a, as an artist, is that people in industry, if they find somebody who's smart, a little bit knowledgeable about their industry, the way things are being made, and have a, a, a fresh perspective on how to make stuff, they're curious about maybe I'm going to learn something that's going to help me in my business. And I like this guy because something interesting is going on. And, and I, have, I have a whole slew of people who help me. And when I need something, I can go to somebody and I say, hey, listen, I need to have some tempered glass, blah, 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 blah. And he, and this, there's a place in Brooklyn who will make it for me. And he trades me jewelry because his wife loves my jewelry. And I have another person who I get wire from, somebody I get reflective metals from. And uh, it's actually been a lovely way to engage the world. Um, I'm gonna, any questions at this point? Anybody have a question? So, so that's just glass with the silver on and the um, copper on the back and then you made your design. Right. And the light is... The light is... is, is, is what you say? The light is coming down. It's hitting the mirror. Okay. And as we all know, light just gets reflected. The angle of the perpendicular, how perpendicular it is, uh, will, and where the light is positioned, shows me will, is, is, is what... Um, mathematically determines where the light, the shadow is going to fall. What I can do sometimes, and that is that um, I can have the top piece taller than the bottom shadow if the angle of the mirror 
is a little bit tipped down because then the angle is different on, to that plane and it goes higher. Do you figure that out mathematically or do you to, figure it out by I, playing around? I play around. Okay. But sometimes I have to know exactly what a space is. I have to figure, I know I have this much space and I, I, can, fi I can figure it out mathematically if I need to. And sometimes I'll do a piece and uh, I'll do a model um, of that if, it's, if we're doing an installation and the room is so big and I, don't, I, I can't go up to the ceiling and figure out where the lighting is by just you know, getting on a ladder, I have to make like maybe a quarter scale model or something and make it as accurate as I can and then use a little laser light to, to see what I want proportionally the piece to be and to know where it should be in the, mounted in the ceiling because you don't start mounting if you're on scaffolding and say, oh, we, we made a big hole in the ceiling, now move it over six inches. You know what I mean? That's, people aren't happy like that. <laughs> the math helps. Um, I have a little laser pointer with me so that I can um, show you um, what's going on. These three pieces are pretty much the same. Uh, there's four, three lights here. Two of them are mounted right on the track and one of them is, uh, is on a gooseneck. So it's a little, it's off the track. It's, the angle is a little bit closer in so that the shadow's deeper and the reflection's higher. And these, the light out here is, is reflecting and causing all the lines to go in this way. These, this one's outside and causing these to go outside. And this one's pretty centered in the middle. And I love with the cross hatching of that stuff. You know, it feels like, um, this is called rushes. You know, it feels very organic, you know, like reeds or something, rushes in a, someplace. Uh, I would like to kind of walk around and just tell you a little bit about these pieces. Sure. Okay, there's a, there's a piece right over here, this one. Uh, sometimes pieces kind of get their own names and sometimes I give them names. Uh, in, in, <clears throat> in honor of Jackson Pollock, this one's called Jackson. You know, he was, uh, Jackson Pollock was someone who did a lot of pouring paint and that's how these were done and it was fun to be able to uh, from everything that was so uh, initially everything was so accurate and I had to worry about um, putting resists on and cutting it and thinking I was thinking very accurately this was like so free form it was fun to play with and there's a little bit of color in these there's like that one and that one whoops and and somebody once, I, there was some show, and someone says, is this work green? I said, sure, you know. And there was that one little spot. That, was, that made it green. <laughs> mm. um, this piece is called circular weaving, and it just looks like what it is. Um, sometimes I outline the edges of the pieces with tape. Um, it, gi it gives it an architecture to sit in. It holds it, even if there's a little bit of shadow over the line, it's like structurally contains everything. Uh, this is atomic and uh, um, there's a, there's a stamp that the United States government made that has a symbol that looks something like this and there's a, a quotation by Eisenhower which uh, talks about um, how that we should be using the power of in the inventiveness of man for the good of mankind. And it was like, uh, I, I actually saved that, that stamp mounted, it seems so. Uh, it was such an optimistic period in America. Uh, this piece is called Sunspots, uh, although it's called Frame Sunspots. 
uh, one of the things about installing this kind of work, um, you never know exactly what the, the room is going to be looked like or the space. So when I came in, um, I was originally going to have another piece and it was going to come down to here. Usually it hits the floor, but it just didn't work with that molding down there. It just seemed to interfere and it just didn't work. So we took off one piece, but, and then it got framed and I'm, I'm, it's th I'm thrilled with it. You know what I mean? It, it actually lightened it up a little bit. Um, this is cross hatching. And to me, it's like a little drawing, you know, just a little line drawing. Um, it has, it actually, it's been fun to be in here alone with this piece. It feels very silent. This one got retitled for, for this show, uh, Edinburgh Shadows. And there's a, some, this has a, uh, doesn't have the same kind of light. Instead of MR16s, this is a, a halogen PAR30. It's a bigger bulb. So when the light comes through, uh, like a hole in there, it spreads out more and it softens more. It's uh, because of, there's more light, it's more umbra and pent umbra. Um, and in these three pieces, the copper is used um, here the reflected light shines up to here and it hits underneath on the copper surface so the copper color gets reflected down and there's a little bit up there and it gives it that kind of very soft lovely quality uh, I did a show in New York called the International Contemporary Furniture Fair and it's um, a show for architects, designers, and I wanted to show my light sculptures. And I, then I was, after I paid my money, I said, geez, I should do a piece of furniture. So this was made just for, especially for that show. And it's a wall-mounted chest out of bamboo plywood, so it is green in some way. And it's got four drawers, two on each side. And this glass top has the mirror embedded inside. And this is all reflective light. And I really like that the shadow designs the front of the chest. That just four inches out here makes it like the perfect size design on that. Any other questions? You use so many different kinds of lights, but they are our shapes. Um, and then, like those have something reflective, and then there's big ones, and there's little ones, and there's long the, ones. There's not, yeah, there's, I, I'm, what I'm trying to do is, uh, there's only two kinds of bulbs, but uh, one the of the things, are, pardon? The shapes are different. Yeah, I, over here, I didn't want you to see, if you walk underneath here, you can see the, the light bulb himself, mm -hmm. and if you were back here before, you could see the light bulb. And I, didn't, that, I always find that if I'm going into a, a, a space and the lights are shining in my eyes, I think the architect or the designer has made a mistake. You shouldn't be seeing, you know, if, you're, if I'm looking up here and looking at the light, I'll see it. But if I'm walking into a space, I should be able to feel like it's lit and I don't even think about it. So I covered up the lights over there so you don't have to think about it. And this is the same thing. I somehow those that round shade fit that bulb and I cut off part of it in the front so it worked. And this was this shade is a commercial shade that I put a baffle on, a bigger baffle, so that I could if the light here that you see on my hand isn't on my hand anymore. So that by the time we get up here that light is is stopped so that the reflected light can be stronger. You know, see down here, there's still, ref there's, there's light from the, the uh, light bulb and reflected light, but the density is darker to the shadow here. Pardon? 
but, but yeah, it's some of that, but it's, it's um, I certainly don't think about that too much. It's like, how am I going to make this work better? That's the thought. You know, something's not right. What can I do to make it feel c clearer or stronger or more uh, accurate to kind of represent something? And that's, um, the, there's certainly a physics approach of being the, the scientist kind of thing, but I've been, I've been doing this stuff so long it just feels like, you know, I'm playing actually. You know, it's the way I like to play, you know. <clears throat> this piece is called Vectors, um, and it's for a little piece, it's got a lot of punch. Um, and it's interesting how, and this has, uh, this bulb is a little bit different than like the bulb over there. The one over there is a wider piece, so the uh, spread of the bulb is 36 degrees here. This one's 24, and that's still not a spot. Spots are usually 12. Uh, I needed to have the width. And one of the things that happens here is because the light bulb is exactly parallel to this edge, the reflected, the, there's no um, spread out over here. Everything is, per, is vertical because the light bulb is in the same plane. And because it's in that plane, that same thing, on, it comes from an angle here and gives me that spread out on an angle. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the light. This is light and reflected light. And this is shadow, and this is light and shadow, reflected light and shadow. So I get a lot of variation of color there and tonality. Um, any other questions? Hello. Hi. Come on in. How do you fix onto the wall? Um, there's, the, the, there's these lovely plywood walls here, and there's holes drilled, and they just go right in. Sometimes, sometimes um, if on permanent installations, sometimes things are a little more permanent done. Um, do you use lights in the colors? Do I use color? I have used color sometimes. Um, it just doesn't do it for me, you know. I had somebody wanted to commission a piece. They wanted colored. They wanted colored lights, and I worked with it. And I worked with it, and I said, "Geez, I don't like this." You know, it just didn't. Um, there's something very pure about just white light. You know, it just feels, you know, good to me. The colored lights. Um, uh, something a little bit um, too s strange to me, or phony, or something. But that's pardon. Oh, I have done pieces on colored walls in my kitchen. We have red walls, like a brick red wall, and it works the same way. What ends up happening is there's a bright red and a dark red, and it actually looks really interesting on. Um, on colored walls because of that. If you have any interest, you could go to my website, sydneycash.com, and you could go to sculpture and light sculpture, and you could see that. Um, the, I, I like colors because it's the real color of the wall, and there's this manipula same kind of manipulation goes on. <clears throat> 